Fiat is now a postdoc uh, research fellow uh, here at Leeds Beckett and still combining that role uh, with her role at um, Queen Apple Burgers. Um, Fionn is going to present on um, uh, basically her PhD study and Fionn's got her viva on Tuesday uh, so she's really excited for that. So while she's presenting, I think some really difficult questions for her just to get her, to get her into Tuesday. But she's going to present on her, her work on, uh, I guess, holistic impact evaluation at Queen Apple Burgers. Um, very broad and I think hopefully some really important uh, messages to finish the day. So over to Fionn. Thanks guys. I was kind of hoping I'd put myself last and most people have gone home by this time. So thank you all for sticking around uh, to listen to this presentation. Um, so firstly, I think, you know, what a fantastic day it's been. Hearing so many great presentations, uh, a lot around kind of sports strategy, uh, PE, athletic competence. But what I really want to talk about is to put ourselves in the shoes of the athlete. So what is it really like for these student athletes within the school settings that we're in? Um, and looking at that from a holistic perspective. And, this is from findings from my PhD thesis, uh, which I'll talk through, which I've done in collaboration with Fika, Kev, and Ian, who are in the room today, so thank you for all your support throughout. So just take us back at kind of the big picture in new sport. So these kind of themes have come across the whole of today, but over the past years, Olympic and professional sport is now arguably more competitive than it's ever been. And this has then led, over the last decade, to a really big increase in the professionalization of new sport. This has then gone to the risk of then youth sport not just looking at then the focus of recreation activity, but talent, development, and winning taking a massive focus. So this is the picture that we're at now. The intensification of freshmen of the youth sport has led to many positive impacts, but there is a real critical ethical concern on the impact this has on how we develop talent, with many negative impacts at the moment highlighted in the literature, the literature in terms of academies and identification environments. But impact is multifaceted. Again, this is a common theme across the day. We can't just look at impact in schools and school sport as just about athletic and physical development. Talent development, program involvement, and intensified youth sport has an impact on individuals' athletic, academic, psychosocial, and psychological development. And this has really led to a cultural shift to taking a more holistic approach to how we look at impact and the impact that we are having on the environments that we're in. So looking at things at academics, so academic grades, academic progressions, where they're progressing to university, dual career options, looking at athletic and physical, so their pathways and physical development, their kind of injury rates, illness, and then also the psychological, so the emotional mental state of the student athletes. And then finally, the psychosocial, so looking at the kind of social aspects which is involving. So today we're going to be talking about impact, and we're talking about impact across all four of these areas, and what you're really like student athletes in these environments. And schools are a key part of this. I think this graph kind of speaks to itself. Schools are becoming an integral part of the talent development process. So regardless and despite this success, as we can see from this graph, amongst the voluminous literature that we currently have, there's little to no research in the independent schools specifically and across the impact that they're having on a holistic perspective. So understanding the school school impact is really important. Firstly, due to the increased popularity of sports schools as a, talent, kind of, as a talent environment and as a development process. Due to the low conversion rate to professional status and due to the positive and negative impact of the intensification of youth sport. As such, it's really important for us to understand the impact that school sport is having on the holistic development of our student athletes. So that we can design, implement, monitor and evaluate programs going forward. So overall, can schools, can we as practitioners that work in schools, provide a positive and developmentally appropriate holistic experience for youth athletes, irrespective of whether they make it or not? Also, what determines impact? The success of school sport often depends on many situational factors. The culture and the environment that is created, the features, so the facilities that they might have, or the, uh, the kind of support in terms of boarding facilities or non-boarding, and then also the people that drive the program. So all three of these things will affect whether school sport provides a positive benefit and contributes to school age athletes' holistic development. And this kind of came to the rationale of our thesis. So first, finding out what, what impact are we having on holistic development for the student athletes that are at schools. And then secondly, why? Understanding the characteristics and features of sports schools and the contact interactions that schools have. So we did this across 
four studies. So we firstly did a systematic literature review of current literature, so looking at what is the literature out there in sports schools currently. Then we looked at a retrospective account of a subsample of student athletes and staff. And then we looked at this in time across a whole wider span of student athletes, and then over time, so looked at a whole academic year. So over this, we then really got a good picture of what it's like to be student athletes, and then started to develop some of the reasons why these things were happening. So just to give you a little bit of idea of the context that I was in, so I was in one UK independent school. This school had seven years experience of providing DC support, eight performance sports, boarding and non-boarding, and across that, 85 student athletes participated in the study across the whole year. And six staff within study two, and also a whole school observation. I was embedded in this environment. I was there three days a week on a weekly basis uh, across the whole 33 weeks. So again, through whole school observations, we were able to get other pictures. And we did this across nine data collection methods. Holistic impact is complex. School environments are complex and involve a lot of things. And we had to track multiple factors in order to get a holistic picture of the impact that we were having. This required multiple methods. And by kind of using multiple methods and kind of concerning, we can then really get a good, clear picture of the exact impact that we are having. So finding out data as well from the automation research, then looking at that with log diaries, semi structured interviews, questionnaires, we then really were able to get a concrete picture of the impact that we were having and the findings of process and data collection. So, to the fun stuff, like what do they feel like? So what is it like to be student athletes in a school? So first, kind of focusing on the academic and vocational impacts. It's competing demands. These children have to like, balance a high physical and academic workload, up to 24 to 28 hours a week of academic studies. They found the sport and academic balance, 70% of them found that really hard. So somewhat challenging, but really hard. So again, that's over the majority of your student athletes are finding this, the challenge between sport and academic balance somewhat challenging. Looking at it across time, when they had less rest and more training, they found it harder to balance sport and academic workload. So that's something to consider within your timetable. So potentially in periods of time across your school, when there's a high physical workload, a high fixture congestion, your kids are going to be finding that balance between sport and academic is hard in those periods. So how can we maybe support them? Student athletes missed, on average, 2 to 2.5 lessons each week. This had a large inter-individual variability, though. So although, on average, each athlete missing about 2 to 2.5 lessons a week, that might not seem a much, but when that accumulates across 33 weeks of the school year, it comes to a lot of lessons, and they tend to be the same lessons that they were missing um, kind of from week to week with where the fixture was made. But also, it's being aware that, although that's the average, you will also have individuals in your program that are missing substantially more up to kind of 12 lessons per week. So we can't just look at this as a whole, okay, they only missed two, they're also, you've got to look, okay, who are the kids in my program who are missing more, and where do they need more support? Despite this, and despite the challenges we mentioned, generally the kids were averaging a B, merit, or above. They generally were happy with their academic development and achievement, and they said that they had a dual identity. So 70% of students identified with both academic identity and school identity. So it's important to know that these kids don't just value sport, they value academics as well, and when we find this program. And then in the long term, there were many positive <coughs> impacts that we had. So academic security, dual career options, and opportunities for higher education and integration into the workplace. So obviously we saw that it was really hard, they found a hard balance, they had to have these competing demands, but there were certain services at the school that then we then resulted in the kids generally achieving the academic grades. And some of the findings may correlate with the fact that the kids had high academic motivation. So within this school, the kids maintain a high academic motivation across the whole year. And this might actually to the fact that they're not only solely more motivated in sport, but they were motivated in their studies, which then, in behind the scenes, within homework, within working in their lessons, they were working hard. Another factor which might be the reason why uh, the kids were generally still achieving quite good academic grades was the additional academic support services the school were offering. So within this school that I was embedded in, that I was researching, they had extra tutoring sessions, they had clinic revisions, uh, they had learning development, um, kind of team support. So on Microsoft Teams, they get extra educational resources. So on all the, although these kids kind of are struggling with that balance, you've got to think of maybe of some of the additional academic support services you can put in place to help aid them through that process and help them balance those competing demands. And then finally, the staff valued and endorsed education. And it's important to note that this wasn't just the teachers, this was the coaches, the boarding staff, 
everyone within the department and the multidisciplinary team at school were valuing and endorsing education. This led to a lot of the kids saying they went in this tug of war, so our medication is value education to tug of war in that direction. Everyone was valuing and endorsing accreditation and sponsoring, so that's when the kids started getting on board that actually this is going to work. Going on to the athletic and physical impact. So probably, again, I don't know if Tom's, uh, unfortunately it wasn't in Tom's presentation, but high injury incidence is a really um, kind of negative impact that we need to be aware of as well. So across the school year, 46% of students and athletes were injured over a 10 week period. And highest injury incidence occurred just after the initial transition back after summer and just after the Christmas break. So I think this trend is really interesting. So again, yeah, a lot of kids are getting injured, but there are these certain time points that we need to be aware of at schools. So after they've had a substantial break over the summer, after they've had a Christmas break, they are then getting more injured, and this is where we're seeing injuries occurring more across the school year. Injury and fatigue were the highest stress scores that we experienced for student athletes, and physical relaxation was the lowest recovery score. With overall, the kids feeling this accumulated buildup of fatigue across time. So as we went across the school year, with the stress, with the pressure, this fatigue seemed to accumulate, and then when we got to the end of the year, they were all kind of knackered, kind of going towards that burnout phase, even though we didn't really track that. So what were some of the reasons why? So there was a lack of organisation and planning on the project. So generally, when the kids came to the school, there was an immediate workload challenge and lack of physical preparation. So the school had no pre-season and no gradual sequential increase in intensity, frequency, and volume of training. So the kids would go off the summer, they'd have a 12-week break, because we were lucky as they are in independent schools, so they had a really long summer. They come back, and in the first week of term, they're at 15 hours of training. In the second week, okay, two fixtures, and there isn't that gradual injury. And you know, there's a lot of strength and conditioning tips in this room. We know that massive acute increase in workload really then has a risk of maladaptive approaches on injury, illness, fatigue. So these are some of the reasons why. There's also the high workload and lack of rest and recovery across the school year. So there's no, some of the students and athletes did not have a single rest day. I think, you know, Kev talked a lot about the training and the planning and the load of these student athletes. They're managing so many things, so a lot of these student athletes aren't having a single rest day in their planting. And there was no systematic plan periods of high training loads followed by intentional low training loads. So kind of a classic school model, they get to the term, high physical activity for eight weeks, half term break. Get back, high physical activity, Christmas break. There was no training or oscillation or tapering within that school schedule that schools that then had that kind of high training loads followed by intentional low training loads. So no wonder by the end of the term these kids are absolutely cracking. And then the, finally, there's a lack of integration and workload management with the wider sporting organisations. So we need to remember as practitioners that these kids are not just in our environments and not just playing sport for us. A lot of them, so in this study, over 55% of student athletes were playing sport externally. So this was for academies, this is for clubs, slightly for regional, at all different levels. And that workload and integration management needs to be considered within your programmes. So you might have a rest day in your school timetable on a Thursday, but your athlete might be going and playing club or being part of the academy on a Thursday night. Then no wonder none of these kids are having a single rest day. So we need to go away from just looking at us in the environment, taking more of an athlete-centered approach, and kind of looking and working with the external stakeholders and having that managed. I think a lot of the kids, uh, like what Lawton said earlier, Ryan, they actually have a track and a record of all the kids and where they're playing outside of school. I think that's a really good idea. In terms of the positives, Generally, the athletes have felt they had an all-round, they developed all-round in athletic and sporting performance, including technical, tactical, and physical elements. Their sports competency was rated between moderate to very competent. They improved in their strength and power, and they found that for our school was an effective recovery, relaxation, and deep stress on the mental side. And again, this is the kids saying, again, great, they're improving in their sport, they're getting you know, more competency, they're improving physically, but they also really value it as an effective recovery, relaxation, and de-stress from maybe their academic and other sporting uh, other workload that they do across the day. And long term, they kind of this then led to maybe professional contracts, scholarships to the USA, or paid for top UK sports and universities. And this was due to a couple of reasons at the school. So one, the school had high quality and qualified coaches and a multidisciplinary support team. So these, they had a kind of nutritionist, strength conditioning coach, physio, as well as a high quality staff uh, specialising in different sports. And this really gave the kids one a foundational knowledge of what it takes to be a sport athlete, but also the expert coaching and support in all the areas and across a multidisciplinary 
uh, abdomen. So again, not just athletes and physical, again, you know, around the injuries, around the nutrition, as well as having a technical, tactical, physical model. It's also a multi-dimensional training program. So again, I like to, uh, so what Rob Rollins was talking about earlier, again, they're not just their program, it's multifaceted. It's not just about athletic and physical, it's about technical, tactical, psychological, looking at some video analysis, looking at in the gym, the physical kind of qualities from a motor competency movement perspective, injury prevention scheme. So it was a multi-dimensional training program. And then they had high quality pictures and training partners. So not only were they stimulating competition between members of the same institution, they were stimulating competition externally as well. So it's again, how can we advocate for, again, high training partners, how can they have good peer support and learn and develop from each other, but also setting up, again, the high competition so we can always challenge them outside as well. And then finally, they had a high frequency of training and individualized support. I want to be careful with this high frequency training because, again, we all know we have more opportunities to develop. It means that, again, they have more opportunities to kind of develop the skills, technical, technical, but this has to be managed. So appropriately managing your training load and kind of giving them more opportunities to train led to kind of more athletic and physical development. And also the individualized support. So individual development plans, performance board profiles. So again, having the individual so it wasn't just uh, looking at athletes in general, but how as well can the individual uh, be improved. Going on to more of the site, the social impacts. Generally, they found this environment very socially intense and a risk of negative social comparison. So again, it's really interesting some of the stuff Fika was talking about earlier in her presentation around at this stage, they do get really embarrassed easily, and they actually, this risk of negative social comparison is something that we need to be aware of uh, when we're advocating for um, our student athletes and within more school programs. But only 40% of the kids were doing extracurricular activities, and generally they did social sacrifices. So time away from family, lack of friendships outside of sport, and limited free time. From a positive aspect though, they found there was an immediate social support and group of friends. So being part of a four sport program or being part of school sport, they immediately have a social support and a group of friends. And they felt claims on acceptance, support, and inclusion into the groups. And they generally advocated with role models, having social status, popularity, and recognition. And these are really positive aspects. So I think the role models ones, they felt responsibility because they felt like they were role models. So they felt that they were around school, they had to advocate for good behaviors they are the role models in the schools for the younger generation. So that actually advocated for really good behavioural outcomes because we were giving them, they felt they were role models, they felt that they had this kind of status. But again, data popularity, again, it's good for school kids and they feel really good about it, but it's something you're aware of they then go over ego, have ego oriented behaviours. They and then this is I think is a massive thing. So they developed a range of inter and interpersonal skills, such as communication, social skills, and so not only were they developing from an athletic and physical perspective, but they were developing as people and real good personal development when they were going through the program. And eventually they developed long-term resilience. And this is advocated for two reasons. So this is the first site. Generally, this was a whole school community. So I think it's really important in this uh, when we're in school settings is yes, you have your individual sports, but you also have a sporting community. So this school really advocated for all sporting communities to be part of one group. So the netball team supports the hockey team, the hockey team supports the athletic, and it's a whole school community. But also they really advocated for them also being part of the regular school. So we have our performance school, we have kids in school, but then also these schools are embedded in the normal faculty. So they really advocate for that as well. And this obviously helps with things like boarding. So it's making sure that we are a whole school community and advocating for a whole school community. It was also an interview school environment. So all the facilities were in one location, so strength conditioning, nutrition, uh, sorry, Feeling, some people were working, and this really provided a lot of opportunities and a lot of time. So these kids spent time together in classrooms, they spent time together in school, and they spent time together potentially in boarding and in their social plan. So this developed many opportunities for the kids to develop friends, relationships, and peer support. But this also had the risk of being really socially intense. So you also have to be aware that in an integrated environment where everyone is in one place, that over time this can really build up. And sometimes this can become really socially intense and kids need to get out. So it's a way that then you can kind of figure that out in the program in terms of looking at, okay, yes, they have some free time. We don't always have to fill that free time by making them all play together. So sometimes, again, you already spend a lot of time together in these environments. So that free time might be for them. Time for themselves or trying to have kids and then getting out of this school environment, maybe a trip away or a weekend, those kind of things. And finally, the school had a holistic approach and intensity coaching. 
I think this is a really important one, probably a strong message across this day. So the coaches, the teachers, the staff, they weren't just endorsing their individual avenues, they really had an approach and intent to their coaching towards teaching the personal life skills of the student athletes. I think the intent part is the best. We can have a holistic approach, we can all say we're holistic, but unless we do it and we have that intent, it doesn't really make a difference. So I think it's actually the intent and actually putting it into practice that really develops the life skills of the personal development of the athletes. And secondly, because the environment demands it. So the climates of the environment, so these kids have to balance multiple kind of sport, academic workload, social life, they have to live away from home. So the requirements of that whole environment basically then advocate for them having to develop time management skills, having for them to develop coping strategies. So that demanding environment is actually then a product of what creates some of these uh, long-term impacts, which is resilient. And it was, it was not just reduced, uh, so the school had this ethos, not to reduce passive players, but to get benefits awarded without taking responsibility. So the school really advocated for responsibility, for accountability. So, okay, for example, one of the kids, so we, we do a lot of video analysis at the school, but they'll give them the video, they'll give them the tools, they'll give them how they'll fix the athlete's responsibility to then maybe tag their own video. They're not going to do it for them. So, again, how can we produce kind of accountability and responsibility to athletes? But I think the next point, however, there was a lack of upskilling. So a lot of the kids that, although they were given this accountability and responsibility, they didn't feel like they had the relevant skills to then use it. So yes, we need to advocate for kids to take responsibility, responsibility, but first we need to skill them in that area. So we need to give them the relevant skills and tools so that they can go away and then take that accountability and that responsibility. Okay, but on to the final one, the psychological impact. Generally, they find it very stressful. Their highest levels of sports specific dress within this November to March period. So this is something that we need to be aware of that actually sports specific dress was highest between November and March. And they found performance pressures and pressures from others. With eventually this building to mental fatigue and then sport and school burnout scores increasing over time. So this is actually from the systematic review. Uh, so the systematic review that we took from all the literature in sports schools, they found the sport and school burnout increased over time, which I think also goes back to some of the activities in terms of that we were kind of were talking about earlier. And finally, which is kind of a new concept that I think we're all probably feeling a bit more concerned about within schools, is body image. So two out of 10 kids within the school display disordered eating behavior and attitude. So this is an area, again, I don't have the solutions for this, but it's an area that we need to be developed that is becoming more of a concern within this environment. This is generally around a lack of consideration and program flexibility between academic and sport timetables. So these kids have an oscillation between periods of high academic stress and periods of high school workload. So we've got the kids to draw out a timeline. So at this timeline, they did their peaks when they felt like the academic stress was the highest, and then also when their periods of high school workload. And they often coincide together. So in periods when they were having high academic stress around assessment periods, around mock exams, also their physical workload was really high at the exact same period. So we need to have more kind of planning and direct communication between academic and sports staff. And also there's a lack of coordination and consideration between academic and sports timetables. So in schools we need to talk, we need to work with academic and sport and groups to identify periods of high academic stress in our timetable and periods of high academic and physical workload. And then work together to have a collaboration on that program. And then the student athletes had varying academic demands, extracurricular activities and sports activities. I think a big theme today is that Everyone's an individual, everyone has individual demands. However, at the school, there's very much a one size fits all approach. So there was a lack of consideration, a lack of planning around all the very academic demands, curriculum activities, and sport commitments that athletes had. Just one example that came to mind so, one of the netball girls, she was part of uh, the performance dance program. So she was there, so we had the dance show, and in the dance show, they trained for five days a week in the evening. But then there was no program flexibility within her sports schedule. She had a normal school schedule and then two hours in the evening of extra dance in the dark social theater area. This is just, again, it's a very that was kind of quite a dramatic story of some of the things, but again, there was just no consideration between the extra curriculum activities that she was doing with this within that week. And then just to end on the positives. Generally, uh, sport was really advocated to have many positive impacts on the psychological health of student athletes. So mentally, so favorable levels of general health and well-being, and fewer mental health related symptoms. And then from the health behaviours, sport was really looking at advocating and shifting their, student athletes were going to be shifting their time away from unhealthy behaviours related to general health. 
come up here as well. Yeah. I just want to end on a couple of notes and some summary stuff. Everybody is different, but I think this is really so. I provided today a summary of generally how student athletes felt within the school uh, school environment, so within sports schools. But not every athlete in that program experienced every impact. So it's worth noting that individuals will interact with the same characteristics and features in the environments you have and might have completely different outcomes. So I'll go on to the slide with a little recommendation for that after. And this is probably an example. So from an individual characteristics perspective, female scores were significantly lower regarding sports confidence, perceived sports competency, and general recovery. And females displayed higher levels of general stress and body image concerns. So again, just taking two different groups, they experienced different impacts, and generally there was big concerns within the female sector. And then looking at the external sport for women, so just to explain what this is. So any kid at the school that played sport also externally, so for an academy, a club, or a regional play one, class of an external sport uh, commitment. They had additional time commitments. And they generally had significantly lower general recovery scores than the kids that only play sport within the school. And their fatigue and lack of rest and recovery were further exaggerated. So again, these are just little pockets of individual characteristics and individual people within your program to need to be aware of. So just to summarize, I'm nearly there go. There's a wide range of positive and negative impacts, immediate, short and long term, that student athletes have on holistic development. But generally, there's immediate and intermediate risks of generally long-term positives. So how can we help mediate some of these immediate and intermediate risks without providing that, you know, someone challenged needs to be there. They can we support around some of the physical workload, reduce the injury rates, higher ground planning, those kind of factors. And they were driven by several different features and processes of the sports program school. So these, so generally, so those practical organizations are from my thesis. If anyone wants a copy of them, uh, you guys probably all of my emails and the amount of spams I've sent you over the last kind of few weeks, email me and I'm happy to share further any of these practical recommendations. Uh, but generally, as practitioners, we should be aware that we can promote and negate health impacts through design of an appropriate learning environment that simultaneously balances multiple training loads, academic, psychosocial, and psychological factors that can be challenging for these athletes. And due to the fact that everybody is different, I really encourage schools to design and implement monitoring and evaluation tools that assesses the holistic development of your student athletes in your environment. So, these are just some of the examples of how you might do that. All right. Thank you. Well done, Theon. Uh, I guess just a as, she, as Theon just presented, a very comprehensive evaluation of uh, the impact in that school environment, and I think really provides um, the positives and negatives of what of what these individuals are going through. Um, we've got ten minutes for questions and, and discussion before before we wrap up. So hopefully, people have got some real testing questions for Theon to prepare for choosing. Um, yeah. Don't feel like you have to. So we didn't personally look at, so one of the things, so when we were doing our, um, one of the statistical analysis process that we went through, we did a linear mix model, and we accounted for sport a part of that, so we took out that variable, but we didn't personally look at sport by sport. We didn't have a big enough population to look at it at a very individual level. We even looked at it, okay, can we do team versus individual, but our individual context was very small. So in terms of the population we had, we covered a wide range of sports, but there wasn't enough in every individual sector but within the statistics, we accounted for that, so it didn't become a factor in the linear mix problem. So if you had a bigger population, you could go into that? Yeah, definitely. I think we only touched on a few individual characteristics, so females and males, uh, external sport involvement, and boarding versus non-boarding. But there are so many more ways. So we need to look at it on a sport-by-sport -sport basis, maybe individual sport versus team to begin with, and then maybe take that down into multiple sports. But also, if any other further characteristics uh, should be explored in terms of whether, you know, our kids who have better coping strategy mechanisms finding it easier, and there's so many different elements that we could look at and compare. So this was just a very touch on the individual characteristics, and that's something in the future should definitely be looked at more. Everyone's ready to go home, Dan. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. I'm good. So there's, yeah, there'll be limited appetite for timetable change. 
in school, depending on their priority, whether it's sport or academic or whether they play for the Olympics. Um, and often the person who's in charge of timetable change wouldn't necessarily have much understanding or any understanding of the requirements of a student athlete. What would you say are the most important things they can consider when you suggest a timetable change will help the situation? What, what direction do they go in? Do they, they can just say do that sport? Well, I think there's more the consideration within. So when it's more identified, one of the high academic stress periods is in the school year. And when it's in those periods, can the sport workload decrease within that week so that balance between sport and academics is easier? In terms of the kind of the timetable, it's not really more about the kind of adjusting the timetable as a whole, it's just providing more support in certain areas or more adaptability. So say for example, you know kids are wearing three fixtures a week. Maybe that staff member is like, okay, I'm not going to accept them this extensive prep, but next week I'm going to have an academic support session and a catch up session with them to make sure they catch up on all the work they missed. So I think it's more the flexibility and program flexibility within both. But again, I think it comes to the point where this is great giving this back just to sporting people, but this needs to be fed back to everyone within the school. So again, it's a multifaceted approach, and multiple people affect the program and how student athletes um, experience impact. So again, you know, we need to get together with the staff and sport, and at least if we're communicating, we have a better picture of what's happening. So I think that is the first step. Yeah. So how would you convince the staff or the staff and the sport that what you're doing is worth them setting up a catch-up session? I think it's just telling them the positives of the, the kids getting out of it. And understanding it's like, we understand um, positives from an academic perspective, but there's obviously many positives in there from a sports perspective. And I think even the de-stress one is really important. So even if they can't get on board on why athletes and physical development is important, they can probably get on board that actually this is now being for de-stress and kind of a safe environment for the kids to get away from academic work they might get on board. So I think it's it's not about saying why we're not, it's why it's important for the kids. So explaining probably some of the positive aspects that the kids are getting out of it. And then also showing that they have a dual identity. They're not just about academic and uh, motivation, they also have an identity towards sport, and we need to support both of those elements. Ali? Um, how do you, do you think students who are student athletes doing that for multiple sports or sport in different directions, do you think that's sufficient for the student athletes who are able to say no? Yeah. They can speak to the coaches who are asking for their permission. No, so kind of on the content side, I've already touched on enough, but this was 16 to 18 year olds. Generally, within at this stage within the program, they were specialised in one sport. So we had the same effect, but more with external, like tug of war effect that they're getting pulled in so many directions between school and external sport. But generally, by that point, they were specialised in one sport more. But this is again a very kind of interesting where future direction in the study is. This is great. So we looked at 16 to 18 year olds because we felt this was the most demanding time for a student athlete if they've gone to a more intense physical program as well as academic program at A level or meet their studies. Uh, but with future research, we actually need to look at the development across a whole pathway and how this is affected at all the different levels. Stop. I'm not asking the positives of that age group, how much control they had over what they did as a student. And then, second of all, I guess, how much education did they get around managing their own training? Because obviously, they're pretty much professional mm -hmm. adults now. Yeah. So, I mean, did, are they, did they have any control over those skills? Did they want to make sure they were you know, the various coaches? I think it's hard because I think being in a school environment is a set timetable and it's like a time zone. So the sport, so the curriculum at uh, the school that I was at is embedded within the curriculum of the school timetable. So they're expected to be there, like they're expected to be there for a lesson. But what I think the athletes can take responsibility is they didn't communicate themselves if they'd maybe been at a training session about sport. So I think where they can take personal responsibility is yes, they still have to be at that lesson because of this timetable, but they can take responsibility to communicate. Coach, I've just been out for a two hour training session last night, I didn't get a rest day, and then the coach is going to be like, you're an individual, but I have a couple of sessions in. But again, I don't think there was that, that education, and I think that comes back to my point around upskilling. So the kids were generally just, I think there was a lot that kids were just expected to know. I think we actually need to do more to kind of upskill these athletes and support them to then take on that task of responsibility. I think the middle person with all the training load is the athlete. And they're probably the best person to be able to communicate what they're doing externally. And we need to upskill them in knowing, okay, the importance. Because I think a lot of kids, if you ask them, so I was at um, a Ryan's Academy Parkway uh, talk the other day, and I 
held up my hand, how many kids trade seven days a week? Majority of them put their hand up. And then I was like, how many of you think that's bad? No one. So they don't know that it's bad. So again, it's like, we can't expect them because they're like, they're playing sport, but then they, they then feel this massive accumulation of fatigue at the end of the term, they're completely burnt out. But they maybe don't know that that's bad. And how actually, because they all can think more is more. And that's how they know they're actually some of the best sport and more structured part of So I think a lot of that upskilling and education is, is really needed. Last question, Amit. Amit? I'm just going to do a little social plug. Some of us will be going to Woody's pub. Anyone is more than welcome to join. But you don't have to, but if anyone does want to come and have a drink, you're more than welcome. Um, okay, I'll quickly wrap up. We are on time, surprisingly, for once. Um, just